Christian Parenting. This is Cynthia Yanoff, and you're listening to Pardon the Mess. Each week, we have honest discussions about the ups and downs of parenting and the lessons God is teaching us along the way. It's real, it's fun, and it's biblical. Life is messy. Don't walk the parenting road alone. Hey guys, welcome to Pardon the Mess. I'm glad you're with us today. I have an announcement. This is my very last interview on Pardon the Mess. No, totally kidding. It's not, but it could be because I got to talk to Candace Cameron Bure and she's here today and you are going to love our conversation. And people ask me sometimes who I haven't interviewed that I would really love to. And she's always one of them on my list because I just love all things Hallmark. I love how she expresses her faith in the showbiz world. I love her social. And so she's with us today. Finally, it was worth the wait. And we get to talk about her faith, how she's worked through some social media stuff that's been going on in her life, her kids, her new book. She has a new children's book and just Hallmark, all kinds of great things. So thank you in advance for your patience. As um, you know, sometimes I get a little giddy when I'm talking to someone I'm excited about, but she's sweet and humble and kind and lovely. And I can't wait for you to hear this interview today. Here we go with Candace. Hey, Candace, welcome to Pardon the Mess. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And listen, you're Hallmark royalty. We're just going to call it that right now. And we're huge fans over here. As for me and my house, we are, uh, well, yeah, we're, we we believe in the Lord, but we also believe in Hallmark and all things Candace. And so I'm not going to be all weird and fangirl, so to speak, but I'm super, super excited you're here. Uh, well, that makes my day and makes me smile. So thank you. <laughs> now, what we cannot agree on is how fabulous your social media is and how you're always working out and you are like buff beyond belief. This may be weird that I'm even talking about this, Candace. So let's start that out. But your social media, I started following you a while back and I'm like, this girl works out. I do work out. I I love, I have grown to love fitness in my life. It has become such a big part of my life because I enjoy it and I feel so much better when I do it. And then I love seeing my body change. I love seeing my muscles. I love getting strong. I love challenging myself and doing all these things that I see 20 year old kids doing. So I'm just, right. I'm like, I want to keep up. Well, it's for real. It's the real deal. People need to be following you on social because you'll, I mean, you show like the down and dirty working out and I'm like, golly, that girl's strong. So good work. And so tell us a little bit about where you are in life, about your family, all that good stuff. Well, I, let's see. I, my, I have three kids. I've been married 20, almost 25 years. We'll be celebrating 25 years in June. And my kids are Natasha, she's 22, Lev is 21, and Max is 19. Okay. And yeah, they're kind of, we we were empty nesters last year for the first time. All three of my kids had moved out in one year, and now one of them's back home because of what happened last year, you know, the right. pandemic. And then the other two kind of come in and out. So life is still changing and evolving on the kid front. But I thought I was like done. No, you know, not, not done, but never. I was so sad to see them leave. And I'm very happy that one of them is back. For sure. My oldest is about to go to college and I'm not even sure what to think about that. But then they kind of, my, they kind of stretch in age. So I've got all the way down to four-year-olds. So I always laugh about like when my four-year-old goes to college, like I'll have, I'll have my walker and, uh, <laughs> They'll let me out of the nursing home for the day to get him to college. So there you go. So being married almost 25 years, I celebrated 20 yesterday. And well, let's just say right now, moment of silence. Thanks. That's a long time, right? 20, 25 years. Yeah. What would you say to someone who's earlier on in their marriage journey? Any advice, you you know, something that's gone well or not gone well, but what's some good marriage advice for those, uh, for those that are maybe earlier on in the journey than we are? I would highly recommend biblical counseling. It's not something that we did, but over the years, it's something that I've done Yeah, and it's so helpful and there doesn't have to be anything wrong. It just is, it's so good to 
really talk through some important issues. And over the years, new important issues will arise and to learn how to communicate best. I always, I'm sure you've talked about the five love languages, that book, which I've absolutely um, enjoyed over the years because it really helped me understand that the way I love Val is not and the way he receives it is not the same way that I receive it. We like two very different things as far as feeling loved. So reading that book is a great start, but going to biblical counseling, you can help understand that. And then also have the person in the middle, because if you tend to get a little hot headed or argumentative, that person's like the mediator that can just say, okay, let's listen to this. So I, I think it's important. I think that's so important. And I love that you just mentioned that book because that also was revolutionary for us because I remember like we dated for seven years, like again, another moment of silence for dating way too long. And then we got married and I remember like my husband, he's so sweet, but he would always like make, like buy me these like gifts, like always buying me stuff. And I didn't have to be expensive, but all this, and I'm, and, and I was always like, well, that's nice, but whatever. But I have not, I figured out later this book, I'm not really a gift person. And so I never really gave gifts back. He is a gift person. And so at some point I realized like, okay, you know what? It turns out I'm an acts of service kind of girl. So if you would just vacuum, that would be so much better than showing up with flowers or whatever. So yeah. Right. Exactly. You just learn a lot about it. And they also have one for kids. And I think it helps you also relate to your kids. So that's a good word, but okay. We're going to get to and talk about your latest project, which I'm excited about, but let's talk if we can for a second, just about your life and your career. And I I think all of us would love to know, especially if COVID, we've all lived our own reality too long. Candace, let's live someone else's reality. What was it like growing up? I love you already. (laughs) (laughs) You're funny. What was it like, Candace, like growing up in your world? Like, you know, with this career and like, how did your parents do this? How did, how did it look in schools? Just like, give us a little taste of what it was like for you. So, for, for us, it was very normal. I feel like I had a normal childhood. I realize it's not compared to most people, but it felt as normal as possible because I was born and raised in Los Angeles. So it's not like my family moved across the country to start their children in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, my mom had a friend who had her son in the business and he was on a TV show. And she told my mom, oh, you your four kids are so cute. Let me give their picture to my agent. Yeah. And after a couple years, my mom was like, okay, she, my parents were not in the industry, knew nothing about it. But, you know, I think that was a little glimmer of hope in my mom's life thinking like, oh my gosh, maybe my kids are cute enough. Maybe they could do a commercial one day. How exciting would that be? So we saw this agent and she said, yes, let's try it. And I was actually four at the time. She told me I had to come back in a year till when I was five, which I did. And my brother and I were the ones that really took off. And my, my one sister didn't do it. And my other sister tried it and just didn't like it. It wasn't for her, but here we are like a normal family. And my dad was a middle school teacher for over 35 years. Mm. And my mom was a stay at home mom. And, you know, it was like after school, she would pull up in our Volkswagen bus and say like, okay, you have an audition today. And so we'd drive over into Hollywood and (laughs) we'd go out on an audition, but I started working immediately. So did my brother. And, you know, before you knew it, I was 10 years old and on a television show. Yeah. What was your first big like break? I mean, as big a break, I guess. I mean, someone starts at five years old, by the way, I have a four-year-old and nobody wants him on any show whatsoever. (laughs) So I'm so impressed that you were that put together, but like, what, what did you consider like your first like big break? Oh, well, it was, it was one of the probably fifth things I ever auditioned for. And I got this reoccurring role on a television show called Saint Elsewhere. And it was really popular. It was kind of like the ER back in the day. Okay. And so I was six years old and Denzel Washington was the star of this show. Love I him. mean, it was like really incredible, but I, I was so scared because I was little 
<laughs> at that audition. And I remember actually crying in the room because I got so nervous. Oh, no. but the lady, I, the casting director, I guess thought I was so cute. So she brought me back in with my mom so my mom could sit with me. And I said my lines and she was like, you're perfect for it. And then I was a reoccurring character. I played one of the doctor's daughters on that. And that was, I feel like my big break. After that, it was like the commercials just started coming and all the other guest stars and then Full House when I was 10. Yeah. Full House. Oh man. Love Full House. Okay. And so Hallmark, and I know you do a lot of other things, but I I have to be like hyper-focused on Hallmark right now because I love all things Hallmark. And, and so- Why do you do? Yes, yes, yes. Um, especially again, I think 2020 was the year of Hallmark. I mean, if you didn't like Hallmark before, which you need to stop listening to this show, if you didn't, we just can't, we can't communicate any longer. But if people didn't before, this was the year, right? I mean, I don't know what their ratings look like or any of that. I'm not asking that. But I mean, I would feel like everybody kind of tuned in and we needed that good word in 2020. But did you did you kind of feel that sentiment? It's so true. Yes. Hallmark's numbers continue to grow every year and they certainly grew even more in 2020. And it was actually, they were, they were so specific as a channel, as the three networks that they have that we could not talk about the pandemic. We could not talk about COVID. And I understand that it was very smart. They're like, listen, we are a destination for people to get away from it. We do not want to talk about it. They can turn on the news and talk about it at any moment. So when they turn on Hallmark, when you're doing your interviews, like let's not say the word pandemic or COVID. And I think it was really smart. And, you know, it's it's amazing that they were able to get out all the original Christmas movies that they had planned on doing. They kind of lost their fall lineup because of COVID, but managed to squeeze out like 70 some new original Christmas movies, which was amazing. Amazing. How many were you in this last year? Well, I was scheduled to film four movie, uh, sorry, seven movies. That yeah. includes my mystery movies and Christmas and other ones, but I ended up doing only four because of okay. the pandemic. So I shot three Auroras and one Christmas movie. And you do them all in Canada, right? Pretty much. I do. Yes. And so when you're in Canada, I mean, are they, are, do we just, are we on sets and there's just cute little Christmas towns and that's how this all works. And like, do you feel Christmassy and what time of year do you tape it? I just need a few little things. I promise I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> we can talk about it the whole interview if you want. <laughs> you're I'm totally fine with that. So it depends. Every Christmas movie is shot at a different time of year. I try to shoot my movies at least closer to the fall or winter, as close as I can. I do not like shooting them in the summertime, although I have. Yeah. Um, but usually it would make sense to shoot them in January or February and then hold them for the year. But a lot of times the scripts aren't developed enough or ready to go into production. So I... Shoot mine usually in September, October. And then listen, we have amazing set decorators and they come in and they bring the Christmas. So we will turn an ordinary little street into a Christmas town street. And, you know, a lot of money is spent on those Christmas decorations and then bringing in the snow, which some is fake. Like you can, some movies are better than others. And I like to think that some of my, my movies are really good with the yeah. snow because we always have real snow. There might be a little blanket of fluff, but there's always real snow. They just have like a huge garbage truck basically that has snow in it and they just keep wow. pumping it. It's air conditioned. And then right before we do a take, they come in and either blow the snow or shovel it on. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so it's funny, I, I was thinking about this last year, and they always you always have the fabulous clothes, and you kind of do all the intros for the whole season and talk about it in front of a magnificent tree. And and we were listening to the Hallmark Christmas channel or whatever in our car, and you know, you would tell little stories. And I was like, Cameron is like Mother Christmas. I mean, it's it's fabulous stuff. And so do you have like a favorite one you've taped? Like if you look back on the Christmas ones, you have a favorite one. Did you like enjoy? a favorite movie or those yeah. preview shows? No, I'm sorry. Movie. Oh, yeah. A movie. I always say the, the movies are like my children. Yeah. I love them all, but I love them all like for different reasons. There's special things about each one. 
Yeah, I get it. I get it. And so what what has been maybe without being too personal, like what's been maybe a non-negotiable in your career that you're like, you know, this is just something I'm not willing to do or, or something that you've had to kind of work through being in, in the career you're in, in the limelight. What is something like when we start talking and thinking through your faith, are there non-negotiables? Oh, a hundred percent. I have said so many more no's in my life than I have yeses. I committed a long time ago to be in family-friendly entertainment for yeah. the rest of my career. That That is the lane I want to be in, and I don't stray from that. And I've certainly had other offers, whether they are movies or television shows, that would have been incredible opportunities, and some that the contract was on the table. And at the last minute, I was like, I, I, can't, I can't sign this. I can't do it. I don't feel like this would align with what I want to do and, and, and be in, it would just cross over that line of family friendly entertainment. So that's been a hard no for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say Candace that I would be like the best extra ever, but I mean, I wouldn't be bad. I mean, I might want to get more involved than you'd want me to be, but just know there's a girl in Dallas that will pay her own way someday. And I'm here. So I'm here for you, Candace. If you want to be up here, we will make it happen. <laughs> You're awesome. And so talk to us a little bit about your faith. Did you grow up in a faith-filled home and how did that kind of develop? Because I feel like that was something when you start this early, you've got to get pretty secure in your faith pretty pretty early on in life to, to balance it the way you've done. Yes. So... I actually, the first time I went to church, I was 12 years old. So my mom was always, my mom has been a believer her whole life, but my dad was never a believer. My dad did not want religion taught in our home. So my parents thought they might get a divorce when I was 12 years old. A friend had invited our whole family to go to church in hopes that they could help reconcile the marriage. And that's when the journey began. My Mom was so happy to be going to church, and my dad certainly did not want to get divorced, so he was willing to go. And that's when my journey with Jesus really started. I got baptized at 12. I heard the gospel message. I'm like, this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian now. And I genuinely was truly excited. But as, the, as my teenage years went on and I was working, I, I never read my Bible. I was not in a regular youth group or going to church every Sunday because I had a career. I was busy. I wanted to sleep on the weekends and I was a teenager. Yeah. So my, my, um, my, my faith didn't really kick in until my early twenties once I had children, but, but growing up, even though I wouldn't say we had all of the values of, we had biblical values, Mm -hmm. but my parents would not have, or my dad would not have called them that. They were just good moral values. They were, um, you know, live by the golden rule. And although my mom was a very prayerful woman, but more behind closed doors because she didn't want to push away my dad in that aspect. Right. So it was really incredible in the sense that I have two sisters and a brother, my mom and dad, we are all believers today, but we Mm -hmm. all came to faith in our journey at different ages and times Mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. That's neat. That's neat to be able to look back at that too and just see how God's provision worked through that, even in the hard situation in their marriage, how that propelled forward into the faith of your family. So, Which I should clarify, my parents are still married. They've been married for 52 years. (laughs) That is amazing. 52 years. Wow. And so I assume in the business you're in that there's times where, um, well, it's obvious you've been very committed to your faith and outspoken about it. And so what drives that? Because I could see where it would also be tempting to say, I'm a believer and I'm saved and I'm, and I'm going to live my personal life as a believer, but maybe not set forward in my career with that or make that kind of my hill to die on, so to speak. And so you've, you've done that well. And what drives that? And, 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 and how do you continue to do that day in and day out when maybe you're facing a barrage of of hard places in that. It's really the conviction I have from God himself. It's conviction. That's it. I remember we lived in Florida for 10 years and then we moved back to Los Angeles when I picked my career back up because I had taken a break to raise, stay home and raise my kids. And the church that we were at in Florida, it had a sign in the parking lot. And when you were leaving the parking lot, the sign said, you are now entering the mission field. Hmm. 
And I'll never forget that sign because I think about it all the time to this day. And I thought about that, like, I think the last time we rolled out of that church and then moved to California, I was like, I really am entering the mission field because I'm going back into the entertainment industry. And that's how I've always looked at it. So even though a lot of the, the productions that I do are not Christian productions, and Mm -hmm. I've I've actually made an intentional choice about that. What I love doing is family-friendly entertainment. But, um, you know, I I know that there's all the things that go on behind the scenes that you don't. That's really where my faith kicks in a lot. Aside from making family-friendly choices, my faith is more about talking and connecting with people and sharing the love of Christ with them, not necessarily doing that in a movie on camera. Yeah, yeah. Although that's not a bad thing. No, totally, totally. Yeah, that's what some people are called to do. And and so and it shows up in your social too, that you're just a woman of faith. It shows up a lot of places. And so let's talk social media for a minute. That's not the easiest place to maneuver for any of us. And I think about our kids and I'm like, oh, our teenage daughters. I'm like, oh Lord, help us here. But what have you learned? I mean, what has been your experience with social? I've, I've seen recently where you've had to really uh, fight back on social in, in a really good, respectful way, but not just letting it play out how people are, are going to let it roll out. You're willing to stand up for what you believe in in your family. And so just speak into that for us. Yeah, social media is really hard to navigate. And we're we're the first generation of parents to do it, yeah, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, we're, we're all trying to figure it out. And you know, when my kids were younger, I definitely put rules and restrictions on it. And I had time limits. I would gather their phone at night so they couldn't be on their phones all through the night. And we actually, although Natasha was on social media in junior high school, probably eighth grade or something, my boys, we did not allow them to do it until after high school or their senior year because it was, it's such a distraction. Yeah. But, um, but my boys didn't really care enough about it. (laughs) So they were like, fine. But, you know, the one thing I would constantly tell my children over and over about social media to the point where it was annoying and they were like, mom, I know, I know, (laughs) but I would keep repeating it is whatever you write, whatever you say, whatever picture, whatever video you put up, it is on there for life. For life. And everybody, the whole world can see it. And they'll say, no, that's not true. I can delete it. No, no, no. It's in cyberspace. If someone really wants to find it, they can. So whatever you post, do you want me seeing it? Do you want grandma and grandpa seeing it? Do you want God seeing it? Do you want your employer seeing it? Do you want your high school or college applications admissions person seeing it? Think about those things. Think about everything you post. And so of course we've had mistakes over the years. I mean, we've had a couple blunders where I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, as a parent, what am I going to do with this? And sometimes those ramifications show up right in your face. And sometimes you're like, whoo, dodge that bullet. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know, you, I just think you have to keep reiterating how powerful social media is, that it can be really fun. It can be interactive. It can connect you, but it can be very dangerous if it's not used properly. Yeah. And then of course we can talk about the whole comments on social media because that's like a whole other thing to deal with the emotional end of social media with your kids. Yeah. And, and I think, you, I mean, obviously you've had to deal with that a lot recently. And in fact, I even, um, and, and we don't have to go into this. I'm fine if you don't want to, but I even showed my daughter recently and um, she's the only one of mine that has social media, but I showed her kind of what, uh, how you had posted your Christmas card, I believe it was, and how cute it was and how quickly that turned so ugly. And I was saying to her, like this beautiful Christian family that there's nothing to pick apart about this family at parents or otherwise. And look how negative this got, how fast, uh, how quickly it happened. And just a reminder, one, that we just always need to use the right words. And, and, and I think, I hope my kids know that and be kind and loving, but also that you can't control what other people are going to say. You need to be, your identity has got to be in the Lord because people, people are tough. They're mean. They don't know the Lord. Sinners going to be sinners. And so um, I just wondered how you walked away from all of that. Does it make you want to just shut down your social or does it encourage you to like build up more and for the Lord and go with it? 
the Christmas card photo was actually one of the toughest ones. I have pretty thick skin when it comes to comments. I, most of them really don't bother me. I let them go. I roll off. They, they, they roll off my back. If anything, I just hit them back with kindness and they usually go away because they don't know what to say if you're nice to them. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know, mama bear, you poke mama bear. For sure. I'm going to speak up. And so that one was actually hard for me. It, it was very upsetting. And even more than the people that were just outright negative, it was the people that thought they were just being cute and funny. It was mm-hmm. actually a lot of the people that are, that are fans or Christians or just other parents, but they started nitpicking the photo and thought it would be, I don't know, laughable. And I'm like, who, what, you tell me what family is going to laugh at the fact that you go like, oh, your daughter doesn't look very good. What is she like scared? Is she looking at a ghost? Why does your son look high? Like, really? Do you think that's funny? I don't think that's funny. No. No. So it was, it was those kinds of comments, not really just the straight up mean ones. I kind of, you're like, whatever. Yeah. But Anyway, that's where Mama Bear was like, you know what? You can't, this is wrong. Shame on you. Mm-hmm. Because this is someone's family and these are, we are all real people. And my children are adults, but they're still young adults. And these are hateful comments. You should do better. Yeah, do better. For sure. for sure. Well, I thought you, yeah, not that you're looking for my approval, but I thought you handled it so well. And I was, I was like, yes, you go girl. Don't let people talk that way about your family. And so, yeah, that's a whole nother, whole nother level of mama bear. So give us some, give us some parenting advice. And I preface this by saying, Candace, there ain't anyone listening to this, nor myself that thinks we're the perfect parent. And so at any given time, especially when I try to be really, um, really, I want, I don't want to say high and mighty, but really on top of my game and give some great parenting advice within hours, someone calls from the school or something goes south. So, but just from your experience of raising kids and now you've got young adults, like what, what would you speak into parenting, especially as we're raising kids in today's culture and we're trying to do it well for the Lord. We wanted to love the Lord. What would you say? What would you encourage people in their parenting? Consistency is key. I can't stress that enough. Sometimes as a parent, you feel like a broken record, but it's exactly what kids need to hear. You need to hear something over and over and over before it actually sinks into your brain. I do believe that's scientifically proven. I don't have the study in front of me, but that is really key. And, you know, this feels old, like old school, but you have to be a parent first and not you're f- not their friend first. Listen, I love hanging out with my kids and I love that we have the kind of relationship. And now that they're young adults that we do, we really enjoy each other's company and we get to hang out, but that wasn't the relationship in the younger years. I was their parent first, as was my husband. And we love to have fun and love on them, but the rules were the rules and discipline always had to be upheld. Your kids will very quickly manipulate you when they know you're a pushover. If you say something, but don't actually stick to it and, and, and do what you have told them you're going to. So, you know, sometimes if you would ask my kids, if you still ask them today, how we were as parents my kids always said the word strict first, first word out of their mouth, strict. And that actually makes me very happy. I'm like, yes, I was a strict parent. I don't think I was unreasonable. I let you try everything. I let you do these things. I didn't keep you captive like a little bird in a cage. I let you explore and do it, but there were still boundaries. And I watched that. And, um, and I also let you fall. So you could learn. That's the other big thing. Hardest thing for me to do is let, let them fall. Yes. Yes. I heard someone say the other day, their best parenting advice they ever received was don't prepare the path for your child, prepare your child for the path. And that, yeah, letting them fall, letting them fall. So yeah, that's a good word. And I think what you're saying is like, as I get a child that's getting closer to a young adult age, I realize that you can be friends with them later on if you do the hard work early on. But if you don't do that hard work, you may not want to be their friend later. And Exactly. That's exactly so, it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you have a new children's book out and it's actually, you've written, I believe eight books. Is that right? And this yes. is the third in this series. 
This is the third in the children's book series. Yes. Ah, it's cute. Candace's playful puppy and the cover is darling. Yes. I, I, I love these books so much and the illustrations are so beautiful and they're really fun. And in this in this book, Candace adopts a little puppy and she has to learn about the responsibility of taking care of a pet. But the theme of the story, the takeaway, the lesson being learned is all about faithfulness. So you have to be faithful in, in feeding her dog, walking him, washing him, uh, and training him. And those things kind of go awry as the story goes on. But, you know, faithfulness always prevails. It always does. You'll always be rewarded when you're faithful, especially when the going gets tough. And that's what I was going to ask. And maybe you answered that, but why faithfulness? Do you pick little attributes like that you want to enforce in each one of these books? Okay. And why faithfulness? Okay. I'm not that brilliant. Here's where the the attributes come from. (laughs) (laughs) So I just chose, which is, I've always wanted, I I mean, for 20 years, I wanted to write books on the fruit of the spirit. Hmm. So all of the, the, you know, the previous book before this grow Candace grow was all about patience. Um, so the next seven books will about, will be about love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control because I've done patience and faithfulness. So that's really what the themes are for each book. And I just find and think of the best story that will correlate with that virtue. And, um, I thought I'm a huge dog lover. I've had a dog in my home since I was 17 years old. It's like, I just Mm -hmm. love animals and pets. So I thought training a puppy is a good way to, a good example to show faithfulness. Yeah. I love that. That it's the first of the spirit. So that that's neat. I I have, and I have looked at the book and now I I can't off the top of my head, remember, it doesn't have actual Christian content within it, right? It's just that it has the undertones, kind of like everything you do, that it speaks into Christian values, but it's not directly Exactly. Okay. That's exactly it. Cause I wanted it. I wanted ever all families to read it. Yeah. And there's also, it's, you know, it's interesting in the publishing world, depending on if you use certain words, mm-hmm. uh, whether it goes into the Christian section or religious section or not. Um, but I, I, it actually is in the Christian religious section because I chose to use the word prayer and mm-hmm. that's the only bit of uh, religious undertone or yeah. it's not an undertone, but I said, Candace says a little prayer because little freckles runs away. Yes. And that was so important to me. I said, you know what? I'd rather it be in that section because it's, I want to teach children about prayer, but again, that's as, as much as it, as far as it goes. So I hope yeah. that all families really do enjoy it. That's always, it's always part of my choice is that I, I know who I am and I love sharing my faith. And I do that so much in, not just in my private life, but on social media, mm-hmm. I should say in my personal life. So when I'm working, I like to do all, everything that's family friendly. And then if people want to get to know me better, they, they will know me as a Christian and my beliefs, but I don't always need my work to reflect Christianity for every program or movie that I do as long as it stays within the boundaries of what I believe is good. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, it's a, it's a darling book. And what's the ages on it? Like under eight or eight, four to eight, four to eight. That's what I was guessing. It's really cute. And you can find it in all the usual places. We're going to link it in podcast notes and all of that. And so as we start to wrap up, Candace, just tell us like, how do you know God better this year after the pandemic? What do you know about God that maybe you didn't know before? Where's he working in your life? Just give us an encouraging word on our faith. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, 2020, I mean, it smacked all of us in the face and it's really brought our faith forward. I've never had as many people coming to me asking questions through social media than any other year or time in my life. And I, I honestly feel incredibly humbled by it and feel very blessed that the Lord has used me in this way. Although he uses all of us, our platforms are just different, but we all have a platform. And so I've just been in the word even more, you know, the, the Bible for me, I try to read it every day, but depending on the season, depending on what's going on, sometimes it's like the first thing that gets pushed aside. Cause I'm like, ah, I need an yeah. extra 30 minutes in my day. I'll just, I won't read right now. Let me do this. 
and then you end up not reading. So with 2020 and now 2021, reading the Bible has been such a huge priority and to not skip a day. And so I'm reading, I've read the whole Bible a few times, but I am committed to reading the Bible in a year Yeah, this year. So I started at the first of the year with a couple of other girls. So we are kind of like pushing through it in a way that I haven't done it before. Because a lot of times I like to stop and take time to study each book and words. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so much in it, but I'm not, I just really want to read it through like a best selling, like the best selling book that it is. And what God is showing me through that is actually faithfulness and obedience. Mm -hmm. So it is, I need to be obedient to him to make sure I have my time every single day. Mm, That's a good word. Are you reading through chronologically? Yes. Yeah. That's what I've I've never read it through chronologically before. That's such a good, I, I've done that before and it's really great. And I always like, I've been doing that too. And I got caught in Job and I, then I want to do the same thing, stop and study it and be like, okay, I love when God comes the end of Job and, you know, says, where were you when I created? And I love all that. So I've just been through that. Yeah. It goes like this. Yes. Match on the face. Yes. Where, where were you? you? Yes. That's amazing. Well, Candice, we are going to make sure everybody finds your book and you have so many other great things. Um, is there anything we're looking forward to coming out soon? What's next on the agenda for you? Well, I'm, I'm actually in Vancouver right now because I'm shooting two new Aurora Tea Garden mysteries. So that will be, those will be out later this year. Oh, good. And you know, the other, the other thing that um, I love to share is that I do have a, a lifestyle brand with Dayspring and I've written several devotionals with them as long as well as we have some Bibles and all kinds of faith inspired products for your home. And that is really where my heart is at. I have been building this for many, many years and so happy that we have all of these different collections, but I'd love to point people to dayspring.com. You can forward slash Candice and it'll take you directly to the products that I've done or uh, follow me on socials because we also have them available on QVC, which is where you get like the most amazing value for those products as well. Amazing. So we will link all of that, but yes, check it out. And I've seen your day spring stuff and it's beautiful. I love the design. It's always so pretty. So, okay. Well, I hope all of the filming goes well. And, um, listen, I'm here, Candace, if you, I can be in Canada pretty quickly. So you, you, you send the messenger when you need me, but and, you got and, it. in all seriousness, thank you for your time. Huge fan. Thank you for all you do for all of us just speaking into our faith and encouraging us. And I just appreciate meeting you. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. And anytime I would love to come back, if you ever want me back for more We always want advice. you back. Okay. We do, Candace, always. Be careful what you say, okay? It's all being I mean recorded. It. I don't say it if I don't mean it. You're sweet. All right. Nice to meet okay. you. Thank you. You too. All righty. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Candace. She's so relatable and sweet and kind and beautiful. And be sure and follow us on social if you have not already at Pardon the Mess. We will put some clips from the video clips from this interview so you can kind of see it firsthand. And I'm sure we'll also link it to YouTube so you can look and see the whole interview. And it's fun to see where she is in Canada. But I enjoyed having her on the show. I'm so thankful she joined us. And uh, I will link her Dayspring products as well as her new children's book in the podcast notes so you can grab those as well. We know your days are busy. So as always, thank you for joining us as we pardon the mess. Mm -hmm.